Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Keeping Utah Moving on Trails. Hopefully you guys are all in the right place. The more bodies we get in here, the warmer it will be. Um, in just a minute, I will pass around some sign-up sheets, but I wanted to introduce our speakers today. And you know, it's really interesting when you work so closely with somebody and you kind of feel like you know them and then someone gives you a bio and you go, oh, I don't know that. So Joe, I, it feels odd reading this bio. I hope I gave you the right one. <laughs> So, <laughs> Joe is currently the project director on Mount View Corridor. He has 25 years of experience in transportation projects. Um, he's held a variety of positions within UDOT over the past 20 years, materials, construction, uh, project and program management, including the original I-15 reconstruction prior to the 2002 Olympics. Currently, as I mentioned, he's the project director for Mount View Corridor. He jo joined the Mount View Corridor team in 2010. Sitting next to him is Tiffany Pocock. Tiffany is a transportation engineer with PB. She's got seven years of experience. She went to school in Las Vegas and then has since um, moved and worked in Arizona and Utah with PB. She's been in Utah for the past three years. And then next we have Jeff Golden. Jeff um, was previously a transportation engineer with PB, is now with Salt Lake City. Um, but his background is in uh, pedestrian and bicycle facilities and planning and design. So, I'll turn it over to you guys. Perfect. So as we go over the next uh, hour here, we wanted to do a couple of things. One, have uh, more of a conversation, I think, than us just downloading or lecturing to you so if you have questions along the way that's fantastic you'll between Jeff and Tiffany and myself it's going to be kind of uh, uh, sharing the conversation um, you'll find that we're passionate about trails uh, cycling uh, running uh, pedestrians multi-use of the trails uh, Mount View is a, a little bit unique I think in a lot of ways um, compared to a lot of trails where maybe you come in and you build a trail system and that's it. Mountain View Corridor is built in an area that is going to, going to continue to have growth over the next 20 or 30 years. It's a phased uh, freeway and so communities are going to build around that. Unlike a lot of other areas, the Jordan River Canal, our Jordan River area, a Parley's um, trail system where Really, the area is pretty much grown out. Mountain View is a little bit different than that. It's on the west side of the valley. So here's just a little bit of uh, context here um, with uh, the Salt Lake Valley. If you look, um, thanks. Uh, pointer. Try not to shoot anybody here with this thing. Uh, this, this green section is what's built uh, right now with Mountain View Corridor. It's a 12-foot wide uh, separated trail system. And on portions of it, there's also uh, bike lanes adjacent to the roadway. Um, 2100 North, at I, here's I-15 in Utah County, uh, connects to Redwood Road. That's part of Mountain View Corridor that has the same trail system on it. These purple sections are future, um, future sections of Mountain View that are going to be built. And maybe just a quick disclaimer, um, or not a disclaimer, yeah, it'll be a disclaimer when we start getting a little cagey on you. Um, we have proposals due from three design-build contractors this Friday on the next phase of Mountain View. It's a $180 million program, um, and so there, if maybe you ask us something, and we'll say, hey, we probably don't want to talk about that right now just because of where we are in that procurement process. So hopefully we'll be able to have a really open conversation, but uh, we also want to be very respectful to those three proposing teams in the effort that they've gone over um, in the last, last six to nine months. So um, kind of the basis of Mount View is it's a balanced transportation system. So if you were to go and read through the uh, thousands of pages of the record of decision, uh, the flavor you get from that is this balanced transportation system. So it consists of freeway lanes for automobiles. It consists of uh, transit, um, particularly a center running BRT system along 5600 West from 2700 South to 6200 South in West Valley City in West Jordan. And it also, the picture depicts uh, cyclists here and uh, multiple use. And so that was the idea and that is the flavor you get on Mountain View and that is, as you're gonna see as we continue to build Mountain View ultimately all the way up to I-80 in Salt Lake County and down to SR-73 in Utah County. Uh, one of the, the things is we kind of keep 
working with Mountain View Corridor that's important to us is we have the ability to look at what we've already done. We have 18 miles of trail system out there right now, and we're learning a lot from that. Part of that learning comes from us understanding who's using the system. And we're gonna get into how we've counted users, and we know what type of users are out there, what time of day they're using it, what the air temperature is while what the trail system is being used. So we have quite a bit of data on that, and we really want it to be an asset to the community. The way these things really work is they're connected to other parts of the community, and they're used for a variety of things, whether there's somebody pushing the stroller, somebody on a longboard or rollerblades, or you're on a road bike, you're on a mountain bike, you're on training wheels, or whatever it is. This is a system that we want everyone to use. Just a little closer context of Mount View. Uh, again, 15, we've got 15 miles of trail built in Salt Lake County. Um, futures, uh, uh, 21 miles of trail. And again, kind of the same map we were uh, looking at just a little bit earlier. One of the things we've really worked at, again, and, and really trying to make this system as usable as possible is, and I'll just say, I think a very sincere partnership with the cities as Mountain View has gone from Harriman, Riverton, uh, part of Bluffdale, South Jordan, West Jordan, now West Valley City, and Salt Lake County, is incorporating their facilities as part of the trail system. And we, part of that is connecting to schools that are along the way, park systems, commercial areas along the way, parking uh, um, at various locations, and then recreational facilities like uh, large parks. There's a new county park going in, for example, at 6200 South and Mountain View Corridor. There's a spur to Mountain View Corridor trail system there. When you talk to companies like um, uh, Fetzer Cabinet, a high-end uh, cabinet maker in Salt Lake County, and you meet with them, and do you guys use the trail? It's like, yeah, we use the trail all the time. Why wouldn't we? And you talk to um, folks at, um, uh, I'm just drawing a blank now, uh, USANA and uh, the school teachers. And we've got folks that are riding their bike from Harriman all the way up to um, uh, the Salt Lake International Airport working for the FAA. So there's a lot of users along the way. And so we've worked to make sure we've got connectivity to all these parks, the neighborhoods. We've identified those that are connections now, and those are the ones that are in the green. And then as we continue to move further north, um, particularly up to 201, we have identified at least what we think are the preliminary connection points to connect Mount View Corridor Trail System to the community because that's when it becomes real usable. You can go see a movie, you can go have dinner somewhere, you can do some light shopping, whatever it is. So that's when the trail really starts to get used and you get the numbers going up and you get people out of their cars, it's improving their personal health. I mean, there's just lots of benefits when you make these connections. And that's just kind of an overview of that. Uh, we've got connection to Hunter Park, um, a park on the south end of, of uh, Mount View, which was, uh, um, oddly enough, named Mount View Park. Um, Western Springs Park that's got connection to Mount View Corridor. Uh, Lone Stone, Lodestone Park, that's at, uh, this one at 6200 South, that's currently under construction. Ron Wood Park, um, uh, Monarch Meadows Park. And if you go out on any day of the week, particularly weekends, they're full of people playing soccer, they're out there playing baseball, they're throwing a frisbee, those kind of things. And what we'd like to have is them getting in their, you know, getting on their bikes or whatever it is, their, their wheeled vehicles other than motorized and going to the park that way, having those activities occur and then going back home rather than getting on the roads. And then just a brief overview, overview again, this uh, next piece, 5400 South, the 41st, the RFP is out. Proposals are coming in um, uh, Friday. For us, that's like Christmas, right? So we've been looking at hearing what is going to be done for the last year, and finally Friday we get to see here's what we're proposing to be done. So we're obviously pretty excited about that. Um, and that piece, uh, just kind of in general, two miles long, there's 21 structures in that two miles. Uh, seven of those are um, trail structures um, through that two mile section. Uh, it'll be under construction in 2016 and 2017, and then we'll move right into moving further north up to uh, SR 201. I think this is where I turn it over to Jeff. Sounds good. I'll stand up here, Joe. Yeah, you want the, you want no, I'll, I'll, I'll be here. This okay. is good. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Tiffany, I, Tiffany and I are going to stand up here next, and we're going to talk about some of the major design considerations. 
that we had when we looked at uh, developing the Mountain View Corridor Trail. I'm going to talk a little bit about separation from the roadway. Tiffany will talk about grade separation or at-grade crossings. She'll also talk about slope. And then I'll come back and talk about access and wayfinding. So when we developed these major, the, the considerations and the guidelines that we're going to go through, we relied as much as possible on national guidance, best practices, everything from the US Access Board to the MUTCD, of course, as well as to uh, AASHTO's Guide for the Development of Bicycle Facilities. So the first thing I want to talk about is I want to talk about grade uh, trail separation from the roadway. So we have two general, uh, two general considerations when we are looking at separating the trail away from the roadway. Two general uh, um, sections of right-of-way. One is where we have a significant amount of right-of-way. When we have a significant amount of right-of-way, we have a lot of flexibility in where we can put the trail, right? We can put the trail right up next to the roadway, or we can put the trail as far away as possible from the roadway, right along the edge of the right-of-way. Now, there are pros and cons to both of these. One of these is, has to do with the topography, so if you have a steep grade, that might dictate where you want to put the trail. Tiffany's going to talk about that here in a little bit. Um, you may think that riding right up next to the road isn't the best, so let's just put the trail all the way to the edge of the right-of-way all of the time. That's not necessarily practical either. What we want to do is we want to find a really nice balance in terms of recreation and utilitarian uses. So we want to find a location for the trail that is fun for people to get out there after work, in the evenings, and ride for enjoyment. But we don't want a trail that's too far away and too circuitous. We want something that still will get people from point A to point B in a relatively quickly and straightforward manner, right? That's especially useful for, useful for those utilitarian uses. So as a bike commuter, I want to leave my home and I want to ride on the Mountain View Corridor Trail and get to work in a relatively quickly man uh, relatively quick manner. This is an example of a section of Mountain View Corridor. This is around 70th South. This is a section where we have an abundant amount of right-of-way. So in this location, we were able to place the trail a uh, decent distance away from the roadway. This is a fun, enjoyable part of the trail to ride, but the trail is still relatively straight here, so it does also serve that utilitarian purpose. Okay, the second scenario of the two scenarios I think is much more interesting. So this scenario is probably more common, especially as we move further north on the Mountain View Corridor Trail. This is the scenario where we have a limited right-of-way. So when we have limited right-of-way, we typically still have a little bit of flexibility in where we can put the trail. We don't always have to put the trail right up next to the roadway. We usually have a couple of feet or 20 feet or so of flexibility in where we put the trail. So what we wanted to find out is we wanted to find out what is the ideal separation from the roadway in these sorts of scenarios where you have a limited right-of-way. So we looked at the national guidance, things like AASHTO's Guide for the Development of Bicycle Facilities. We also looked at uh, other state DOTs that have design standards for shared-use trails like WASHDOT. And what the guidance says is the guidance says if you have less than five feet between your trail and the edge of the roadway, you need to have a physical barrier. Five feet is really close. This is an example of a trail that's separated from the roadway by about five feet. Uh, I used to ride this quite a bit. This is in northern San Diego County. This is California State Route 56. It's not the most enjoyable place to ride, especially when you're riding against oncoming traffic, traffic that has a speed limit of 65 miles an hour, so 65 plus for, for free flow speeds. So knowing that, we wanted to know, well, what is that difference that's a little bit more comfortable that's going to increase the user experience on the trail? So to figure that out, we actually decided to go out to Mountain View Corridor. We went out to a section of Mountain View Corridor where the speeds are relatively high. This is posted at 55 miles an hour, uh, and we did some tests. So I'm a cyclist myself. I would actually feel comfortable riding along the shoulder of the bike lane of Mountain View Corridor here. So uh, just me going out there wasn't going to be a real good test. So I brought staff with me, uh, including people who don't normally ride bikes, but when they do, they ride with their kids, and they ride with their kids out here along the Mountain View Corridor. So we went out to this section, we measured distances off from the edge of the roadway, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 feet, and we stood there, and we watched, and we felt, and we listened as platoons of vehicles passed at free flow speed. So we heard what the noises were like at these different distances away from the edge of the roadway. We felt the wind of vehicles, especially those big trucks, as they would push us as we were standing there. What we found, we were, we were pleasantly surprised by this, but what we found was 
that after about 10 feet, after you get just past the 10 foot mark, things start to feel a little bit more comfortable or really they start to feel less uncomfortable. At about 10 feet, the noises started to dissipate enough where we would feel a little bit more comfortable. We felt like the user experience would be something that we could live with at that point. Uh, the, the wind as vehicles passed by was different. We also thought that at about the 10 foot mark, uh, if you were riding with a child and a child was on their bike and they inadvertently went off the shared use path, off the trail, that they might be able to correct or come to a stop before reaching uh, one of the travel lanes. So I think we'll wait for the end for questions. Tiffany's going to stand up and talk about the uh, difference between grade separated and at grade crossings. So I have the littlest voice of the t two other guys. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, so similar to what Jeff was talking about with maintaining the appropriate separa separation from the roadway that you're paralleling, it's also, imp I'm sorry, the obsessive compulsiveness in me could not just leave that on the floor. So similar to maintaining the appropriate separation from the roadway that you're paralleling, it's also important to consider separation from the roadway that you're crossing or the perpendicular route that your trail design needs to, to cross. I'm going to talk about a couple of different options that are available to us, uh, first of which is an at-grade crossing. It's appropriate to use this type of facility when you have a, a low volume, uh, low average daily traffic roadway that you need to cross. Uh, some of the pros of, it's also appropriate to have a, not a very wide roadway that you're crossing, maybe two or three lanes at most. It's important for the trail users to kind of be able to see where they need to go and what, what crossing. If you get into uh, four or five lanes that they need to cross, it becomes uh, a little bit too, too robust. Some of the pros of using an at-grade crossing are that it provides great access to and from the community. It um, allows great connectivity to, the, to and from the neighborhood when you are crossing a residential community. It, great, it creates great circulation for the neighborhood as well. If you're crossing a uh, minor arterial type of facility, you, those types of roadways often allow on-street parking to again allow uh, access to and from the trail. Or you sometimes have a nearby stakeholder such as a park or a school that will lend itself great to like a park and ride or a trailhead type of facility. Uh, some of the cons of using an at-grade crossing is that you introduce a conflict between the roadway user and the trail user. Some of the things that you can do uh, to enhance that is kind of like what you see up on the screen with a sort of offset uh, crossing with a pedestrian refuge in the center. What this does is allows the pedestrian user as or the trail user as they enter that median refuge, uh, to, it forces them to look in the direction of oncoming traffic. Another thing you can do is uh, a raised tabletop or a sort of speed hump type of, type of facility. These are popular because it doesn't uh, force the trail user to descend and ascend from the trail elevation down to the roadway elevation. They can sort of stay perched and understand uh, the direction that they need to go. Um, the other benefit is that the roadway user, it's, this, this type of infrastructure is fairly uh, visible to the, to the people in the cars. Uh, and it sort of is a traffic calming nature due to its speed bump like uh, qualities. But when you try and start to cross some of these more robust infrastructures, these high speed, high volume uh, super arterials with many lanes in each direction, it uh, often becomes more appropriate to grade separate. Um, some of the pros of doing that is again, the removal of the conflict between the roadway user and the trail user. Um, and it sort of protects the integrity of both the roadway and the trail. Neither one of them needs to stop. You don't have a mid block crossing or anything. Some of the cons is that it is fairly expensive infrastructure uh, and it removes access to and from uh, the trail. But some enhancements that you can do is to build sort of what we call a trail spur uh, that gets you access from the roadway that's above or below and uh, down to the roadway. But again, that sort of tends to cost more right of way or construction dollars. Uh, some examples, you'll see a lot of these grade separated facilities uh, in the Utah Valley uh, besides Mountain View Corridor, like Bangadar Highway, a lot of its interchanges and intersections have these grade separated pedestrian structures, as well as the Jordan River Parkway Trail. Um, they tend to cross all of their roadway structures underneath with the uh, tunnel. Um, oh, sorry. 
one last thing. So when you, when you go out and look at Mountain View Corridor, segments one through five that are already built, you'll see a lot of these at-grade uh, type of facilities. And the reason behind that is because once segments one through five is, is the adjacent land use isn't fully developed, it hasn't fully died densified yet, and so most of our existing crossings, we are crossing the sort of lower volume, uh, narrower crossing, but you'll notice that once Mountain View crosses uh, 54th South and heads on up to 201 and even I-80, you'll start to see a lot of these grade separated um, infrastructure because we are starting to cross more robust uh, routes like 41st and 35th. Um, because that area of the valley is, is more densified and more robust. So the next design consideration I'm gonna talk about is grade or slope of the trail. Uh, this may be one of the most important characteristics because it does sort of develop the character uh, and makeup of your trail. If you are riding along a trail that fo similarly, similarly follows the roadway geometry, it tends to look, feel, and get used like a uh, utility type trail a utility type trail like Jeff was talking about, where the MO is to get from point A to point B efficiently. When you start to add in a whole bunch of horizontal and vertical curves or, and uh, robust, or robust grades, like climbs as we call them, it, it tends to start to get used like uh, a recreational type facility. Both are important and both are appropriate. Just, you just need to understand what your roadway or what your trail uh, use is going to be intended for. We've been doing some research uh, both on our trail and several other trails in the valley. And we now know that uh, the trail along Mountain View Corridor is a recreational type of trail. But again, either one is appropriate. It's just helpful to know what, you're, uh, what, you, what the user is going to be. So what is that grade that we should be using? Uh, when you go and look at the uh, Ashto Bike Guide, it recommends a 5% as your maximum. But when you start to think about, I'm a roadway designer, so I know that for most of the facilities I'm designing for, uh, my max grade is between four and 6% for most of the facilities that I design. But when I try and start to uh, marry up all of these considerations, like the one Jeff was talking about with appropriate separation from the roadway, and appropriate separation from the roadway that you're uh, crossing, and you know, being respectful of this maximum 5%, um, most of the Utah Valley is rolling, if not mountainous, so it's kind of hard to be respectful of this 5% while the roadway is already at 4 or 5%, and you're trying to be respectful of all these crossings and all of these grades. So the back, Ashdale Bike Guide actually concedes to this and says that uh, physical constraints, existing terrain or infrastructure with notable natural features can limit your ability to stay at this 5%, and they allow you to sort of have a new set of maximums, um, and, but ultimately defers to the U.S. Access Board. So when you go and look at the U.S. Access Board, uh, they have similar literature on that you need to stay at that f maximum 5%, and we're, here to not, and we're here to tell you to stay at that 5% if you absolutely can, but if your project has these notable features or these constraints that don't allow you to res be respectful of that 5%, there is uh, guidance in the U.S. Access Board that allows us to have a new set of design considerations uh, that range between 5% and on up to 12%. But when you do breach that 5%, they do have mitigation efforts that you need to be respectful of. Instead of the minimum 10-foot wide trail, go up to a 12-foot wide trail. If, I mean, don't just have a, the minimum shoulder width. Instead of a one-foot shoulder, do a three or four-foot shoulder. Uh, increase your minimum horizontal and vertical curvature to improve your stopping site distance for the descent users. And then one of the most interesting ones they uh, talk about is uh, what, we, what they call resting intervals. On the climbing side, uh, once you do breach that 5%, they do recommend the addition of these resting intervals, and you can see in the picture uh, up here, is to add those resting intervals on the climbing side for people who maybe that 5% was okay and they could totally make that climb, but when you, when you breach that and you just tend to go up into the eight or 9%, they may need to have this area where they can get off of the main trail, take a breather, and then get back on and continue on the trail. So what is uh, the best practice in the valley. We know that, again, we have some existing challenging terrains, and we went out, wanted to go out and make sure that we weren't gonna design something or recommend to, to, to design something that wasn't uh, usable to most users in the valley. 
The first one we went and looked at was Mountain View Corridor, the, exi the existing segments. Uh, the first one is, uh, in case those people will know where this is, this is at Bingham Creek. Uh, you can see that we've got some rolling terrain. We have a notable feature that uh, Bingham Creek down there at the bottom and Mountain View Corridor is perched and we have uh, some existing uh, large horizontal and vertical curves and we're at 9%. Based off of some of the research that we'll get into a little bit later, uh, we know that this is one of the heaviest used areas of our trail. So we know that that 9% isn't encumbering use. People are still out there using it. They actually tend to seek it out based off of what we've seen. Then we went and looked at Parley's Trail, which tends to look a little bit more like a commuter trail uh, because it follows uh, I-80 pretty similarly as it kind of connects into 215. Um, and it's even signed at 11%, and most of us trail users know that this is a, another heavily used trail system, and that 11% isn't encumbering use. Granted, now most of us trail users also know that we're not going to take our family out on this trail, but many, 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 many users go out and use this trail, and it's not encumbering the use with that 11%. Then we went and looked at a newer trail uh, down in Utah County, uh, the Murdoch Canal Trail. It tends to follow SR92 for most of its corridor, but then it sort of diverges into the neighborhoods. And as you can see, they've got some rolling terrain and uh, some pretty robust uh, horizontal curves, and a notable feature down at the bottom with that retention pond, and they're out at 7%. So what is that ultimate grade? Like if we have these features that we need to be, uh, or we need to avoid, such as the ones that are in the examples I said, um, what, what should we, what, what is the maximum grade that we should be at if we can't be respectful of that 5%? And based off of the best practices and the Ashto Bike Guide and the requirements in the US Access Board, we, our team uh, developed a 12 to one or an 8.3%. We also do recommend that you use those resting intervals because like I said, maybe that 5% is what the, what the most of the people can use and that does give them a, a chance to sort of diverge off and, and use that resting interval. Now the US Access Board also allows for uh, within the trail tread and an adjacent to the trail tread resting interval and we recommend that you do the adjacent to the trail tread version uh, because if you, especially if you are developing a two-way trail that is multi-use uh, for people that are on wheels, uh, if the descent side, they're not going to appreciate a bunch of grade breaks with these resting intervals. So we do want to be respectful of all of the users, and uh, you can do that with these adjacent to the trail tread uh, resting intervals. So now I'll let Jeff come back and talk about some That's a great question, thank you. Um, so in the Ashto bike guide, they do have recommendations on depending on your uh, design speed, they have minimum horizontal uh, curvature requirements that can guide you to what the sort of best practice is. So you don't have that number? I don't have it on me, I'm sorry. I can, do you have a design speed? I, I can uh, check while Jeff's talking. So that, that is a really great question. I, I appreciate you bringing it up. One of the things that we're really trying to do here, and I hope to get... Well, well definitely about the grade, too. I definitely appreciate the 12 to 1, because, you know, that's basically giving you guidelines for pushing up and pushing and pushing on the trail. Obviously, a lot of these folks can't put their wheelchair on it, but it's still the same. So they, yeah, what we're trying to create here, and I hope we're giving you that sense, is a facility that draws people to it, right? And we know that these trail systems aren't perfect for everyone. Not every street is meant for every type of mobility that's out there. We're trying to reach the right balance in active transportation and not just plop on a trail out there, right? We want people to desire to use this. Um, I do have one question about that though. Are, is, is that the bike that you ride then, is it longer than a road bike? It is, but the returning ways are really like limited. You like to turn around maybe a 30 foot wide road, but that's not my thing. So that'd be a kitchen for a baby, which is, you know, severe in size, but 
Okay. Okay, thank you. Appreciate you bringing that up. And to, Ju to Joe's point, uh, the Ashto bike guide is a guide. It's, it is a guideline, it's not a requirement, and it is the is sort of best practice. And uh, by all means, that is the minimum, but whenever we can, we try and uh, make that wider, more robust. Okay, we'll talk about a few final things here before we move to the next section of the presentation. I wanna talk about a few things that uh, enhance the trail user experience. First thing I'll talk about is trail signage and wayfinding. Wayfinding along a trail is important. It is great along a trail because it helps the user know where they are as well as know how to get to where they want to go. Um, what we did is we looked at the different crossing facilities that we have. Tiffany talked a few minutes earlier about grade separated crossings and at grade crossings and how both are applicable here on the Mountain View Corridor Trail. So we wanted to take each of those crossings a few steps further and actually identify the recommended signing and striping for both of those crossings. So that's what we have here. We relied on guidance as much as possible when we were developing these, things like uh, MUTCD, again, a lot of these signs are directly from MUTCD, as well as AASHTO. The figure on the right is actually an adaptation of one that AASHTO has in their bike guide. So the one on the right is an at-grade crossing. So this is how you would sign and stripe an at-grade crossing. Everything from your regulatory signage to your warning signage, both for the trail users to the upcoming yield sign as well to, as to the motorist on the crossing road here with our, uh, with our trail warning, crossing warning signs, and destination signage. Destination signage here, for example, this is a multi-line destination sign, this could point to nearby roads, it could point to directions, it could point to schools or parks, something like that. So as a trail user, when we're out there running, jogging, walking, uh, riding a bike on the trail, we know where the nearest park is. It, it, Joe was talking about earlier the parks that are adjacent to the trail. Uh, some of them are a block away, or will be a block away from the trail, and this definitely will help the trail user be able to get to those, to those parks uh, fairly easily. The, the image on the, the graphic on the left